for the kind introduction. Can you hear me, everyone? Uh, so I just want to say one thing before I start. Uh, at any time you have a question or a comment, feel free to just raise your hand. I welcome this kind of interaction because it makes me feel like people are listening there. So at any time, just ask. All right, so today I'm going to tell you about the rise of X-ray science and how we can uncover hidden structure in liquids. This is basically a flavor of what we've been working on over the last uh, many years. And uh, what this talk is about is essentially, imagine the following. You wake up one day, and suddenly you have X-ray vision. And you can see through your bones and through your hands, which is extremely painful in the beginning. Uh, but eventually, this can become a very great power. And I'm not talking about just seeing your bones, because this is how you can do it in a hospital, right? You can go and see the images like this. What I'm talking about is being able to see using x-rays down to the level of molecules and make movies like this. So this is basically the dream. Where we, we, we could be in, say, five to ten years. We could be making movies like this using x-rays. So I will tell you now a bit about the background of all this. So the summary of my talk goes like this. In the first part, I will explain about the different X-ray techniques that we are using and how it actually feels to see using X-rays. It looks quite strange when you think. In the second part, I will tell you about super cool liquids and my favorite liquid, water. <coughs> and in the third part, I will tell you about different experiments we have been doing at different X-ray lasers throughout the world. All right, let's get started. So, let's start with a pop quiz. I want you all to participate in this one. And X-rays are some kind of wave, a sort of particle, a form of light, or something you get at the dentist. <laughs> um, it could be that more of one of these is correct. So, the way we do this is, I will just say, okay, who thinks that this is A? Please raise your hand. Okay, I see several hands. Very good. Who thinks that this is B, the correct answer? More or less the same hands. How about C? Uh, a bit more, maybe. Okay. Uh, what about D? <laughs> <laughs> Looks like people are familiar with D. Okay, and it's true. I mean, it's something, they're all correct course, and uh, so you cannot be wrong with this one. And uh, it is something that we experience in our everyday lives. For example, when you go to the airport, you go with your staff through the security, they use x-rays to check your back. When you go to the hospital or to a dentist, they do use x-rays to look through your skin and examine your bones. Uh, so it is true, x-rays is something you get at the dentist. And it's also true that X-rays is light. It's some kind of <coughs> invisible light. So if you look at the electromagnetic spectrum, a big part of it is actually invisible to the human eye. And the visible part is only a small part. The rest consists of gamma rays, X-rays, and ultraviolet to the left. And then on the right side, you have infrared, radar, F FM, TV, and all these longer wavelengths that you use uh, to look at your television and listen to your radio. So, X-rays are also waves, like many of you correctly guessed, and uh, it's an electromagnetic wave. So, they have a certain wavelength. That's the, the length between essentially two neighboring peaks. And when we are, very often we distinguish between hard X-rays and soft X-rays. Hard X-rays is approximately 0.1 nanometers, and soft X-rays is about 1 nanometer. X-rays are also particles, and these are photons, elementary particles, and depending on the type of light that you have there, it has a different photon energy. So X-rays have very high photon energy in comparison to visible light or to infrared. So as you can see, there is a connection between the photon energy and the wavelengths. And that is, the photon energy is inversely proportional to the wavelength. So Higher photon energy, like the X-rays, shorter wavelengths. 
All right, but uh, how small actually are x-rays? Just to give you a feeling, imagine you have a water molecule, like this one here. Of course, in reality, water molecules are much, much smaller than this. But if you were to compare the water molecule to the x-rays, uh, the water molecule would be a, the, the point 0.1 nanometer that I was describing before, would be approximately the distance between the oxygen and the hydrogen. Now, if uh, a water molecule, you can compare it now to give you a feeling for the size to a Swedish crown. So, this is the size of the Swedish crown. Now, a real water molecule, not this one here, a real water molecule, would have a huge difference between. In, in physics, very often we express it in units like 10 to the minus 10 meters, this is the 0.1 nanometers and 10 to the minus 2 meters, this would be the 2 centimeters. So what we are saying is that between these there is 8 orders of magnitude. Now what this means is that if in reality a water molecule was about this size, the Swedish crown should be about the size of the Earth. That's what 8 orders of magnitude mean. Because if you look at the radius of the Earth, that's about 6,370 kilometers, there, again, you have eight orders of magnitude. So that's how small x-rays are. And one of the main things that makes it ideal for looking at the world of molecules is because the length scale is that of the molecules. It makes you be able to see down to this level. All right, so another thing we, we really like about x-rays is that they are waves. And uh, what you can do with that is you can make the waves interfere. So here's one example. Let's say you go to the lake, a lake near your house, and you get two balls like this, and you start bouncing on the water. Essentially what you do is you create uh, two waves, two wave fronts, one that comes from the one ball and the other that comes from the other ball. And as you're bouncing, these waves propagate, and they start canceling each other. When they reach each other, they start to interfere. They can either cancel each other or add, add up with one another. And this is what we call constructive and destructive interference. In this particular picture, you can see that there are some lines that are forming. And this is when you have destructive interference, when they cancel each other. Here's another way to look at this uh, with a 3D animation. So you have uh, one wave that goes through two holes. And this is a very famous experiment in physics, a double slit experiment. And then you have interference. So these waves travel, they propagate, they, inter they interfere with one another. And imagine that up here you have a detector that you are recording this interference. So you can have some places where it's very bright, you have a constructive interference, and some places where it's dark, destructive interference. And you can have that not only with holes, but if you have, let's say, some scattering objects there. So imagine you have two water molecules sitting next to each other, and the x-rays come and they scatter of these water molecules. They create these waves, right? Just like you did in your lake, but in this case with water molecules. So you have these x-ray waves propagating, they cancel each other, and then you can record an interferogram. In real life, of course, it's very hard to just pick up two water molecules and put them there. So what you have is a something that looks more like this. You have a, a bunch of water molecules, a lot of them, and they're constantly moving. So your interferogram looks very crazy. It looks like something like that. And that's what we call a speckle pattern. Uh, it's just a name, another name for this kind of interferogram. So, now let me explain a little bit more in detail of how we do that. How we go from looking this interferogram, this speckle pattern, back into these kind of pictures. To do that, we have to go inside the Plato's cave. Who here has heard about the Plato's cave? It's my dog. I see a few hands. What this is, is basically a philosophical concept that says that what we are seeing, this is us. We are sitting inside the cave. We can only see a projection of reality. Let's say this is reality here. We only see a projection, a part of it. We are always missing a small part of it. It's related to this philosophical concept, but I will use it to explain X-ray scattering here. And the way it goes, it goes like this. This is our source. 
amplifier. Here is the real space. And this is what we call in physics the reciprocal space. This is the projection. Uh, okay, and in this case it's very clear, it's a bird, right? You can easily identify what the projection is. Now when you go and put these two slits that I was describing, what you get in the reciprocal space is this interferogram. So this is basically the same idea. Now, what will happen if we put here some molecule, some kind of protein or something more complicated? Who can tell me? Don't be shy, come on. Very good. We get the scattering pattern. So in this case you have lines, and when you put something more crazy like a protein or some molecule, you get a scattering pattern, the speckle pattern that I was describing before. And this is much harder to understand actually, what it really means. How can you go by looking at this thing, reconstruct this object? There's a lot of research going on in this. A lot of smart people working on this problem. They're using math, very, very difficult math, and uh, very powerful computers to solve it. And it's called X-ray imaging, this process. This talk is not about that. This talk is about how by staying inside the cave, by staying in the reciprocal space, we can get information about what's happening in real space through motion. And to explain that, let me tell you about the hummingbird. The hummingbird is a very beautiful bird that is moving its wings extremely fast. So in order to get a picture like the one you see here on the left, you have to have a very, very fast camera. Extremely fast camera, high-speed camera, and that you can see it looks like it's standing still, like a sculpture drinking from the flower. When you change the exposure time of your camera, you will get something that looks like this. You will be in the situation that you have, you can see the head very clear, and the wings, because they are moving during the exposure time, they are blurry. Then, if you change the exposure time even more, you make it even longer, essentially the hummingbird is moving around and drinking from the flower, so you will get an overlay of many, many different images. And this is basically what we are doing. We are looking at what we call the contrast, and in this case you have very high contrast, it's a very clear picture, whereas here you have a very low contrast. It's a low, uh, it's a blurry picture. And we are not looking at hummingbirds, unfortunately, but we are looking at uh, molecules. So we are capturing the motion in reciprocal space. And you see here, is, this is how water would look if you looked at it with x-rays in real space, because you are mainly seeing the oxygen. In reciprocal space, you get this speckle pattern, this crazy looking pattern. If you were making your exposure time longer, in real space, the image would be blurred out, just like the hummingbird I was showing you before. Whereas in reciprocal space, the speckle pattern also would be blurred out. And finally, if you make the exposure time even longer and longer, you would get something that would look like this, something very smooth, uh, very uniform pattern. And this is how we can get the dynamics out. All right. So that brings me now to the next part of the, of the talk. Well, I will explain you about water. Uh, we are doing water research, and I think it's a very important research, not just because we are doing it, but because it's going to be very important for the future to do that. We will face a lot of challenges related to climate research, so this is going to be one of the, the big ones. In our case, we are mainly interested about the fundamentals, and specifically what happens to water when you go super cool. Okay, so let's have now a pop quiz number two. Super cool water is a form of heavy water, a mixture of cold water and ice, C, liquid water below zero Celsius, or D, very dangerous for your health. Okay, so who thinks the correct answer is A? Raise your hand. Nobody? Oh, one person. Okay. Good, thank you. Who thinks the correct answer is B? Up with your hands. One person, thanks. How about C? 
Oh, okay, a lot of people seem to know uh, that this is probably the correct. How about, and then let's go to D. Who thinks D? At least one. Nobody. Oh, one person on the file on the back. Okay, so now, before I give you the answer, we will do a demonstration here. And we will see for ourselves which is the right answer. So, everybody stand up, come down here on the front, and I also need a volunteer. Who wants to volunteer for this? You. Okay. Okay, Emirate is going to be a volunteer now. Because super cool water might actually be dangerous, we will make sure we follow all the, all the measures against that. Okay. And Rafat here is the, the expert who will be performing today's experiment. Okay, so here we have super cool water. But to make sure that it's super cool, can you tell us what is the temperature in this bath? Yeah. Uh, a thermometer. After this small intermission, hope everybody enjoyed and managed to see that super cool water, the correct answer is actually C. Very good. Uh, so, actually, lots of my colleagues might argue that B could be also correct because there's a big debate in the community what happens when you go very deep to super cool whether there are very small nuclei of ice that are forming. And uh, also, I was reading in the news that there was a rain that came down of super cool water, and everything froze. So it led a lot of traffic accidents. So it actually could be dangerous for the health, strictly speaking. That's why we took all the, all the measures here. All right, so let's come back now to the presentation. We spoke about super cool water, and... Uh, you can supercool many liquids. So supercooling is the process of lowering the temperature of a liquid below its freezing point without becoming a solid. We did that, we saw it very good. And uh, you can find tons of videos online that do exactly what we just saw. That you can throw a nice cube inside and it turns into the crystal. You can also supercool metals, actually. Uh, metals usually have melting point at thousands of Celsius. And you can supercool them by hundreds of degrees. And this is a very cool experiment where they supercool a metal by having a levitated metal droplet. So, why is it possible to supercool water? That's an interesting question. But before we get to that, let me say a few things about crystals and liquids. So, a crystal looks like this you have the 
atoms or the molecules arranged in a very periodic way, very symmetric, whereas in a liquid, it looks a bit more like this. It's very aperiodic, very random. But there is a question, is there some kind of short range order there? And this is basically the topic of this talk. Is there a hidden structure in these liquids? Here you can see J.D. Bernal, who already in 29, he was thinking about these ideas and building models, not just with balls and sticks like is shown here, but mathematical models. And some of his models are now the foundation for a lot of the computer models that we are using. So he did a lot of the early work back then. And uh, he was trying to understand one of the most important, still unresolved questions in condensed matter physics. What is the structure and dynamic of supercooled liquids? Could it be that you have some kind of local order that emerges? It's not like a crystal that is very long range, but some kind of local motifs that appear depending on the liquid. Actually, this question goes even more back in time. And it goes back to minus 400 BC from Plato, who was also thinking about these similar concepts. If you look at uh, Plato's model of the elements, it is very interesting. You can, find, you can read this from Kepler's Mysterium Cosmographicum in 1596. And the way Plato thought about the world is the following. Fire is like a small pyramid. The reason you describe fire like a pyramid is because if you touch fire, it burns you. And this pyramid can pierce your finger, right? If you think air, it's like an octagon. So the reason you describe air like an octagon is because if you have a small octagon like this and you flip it, it can stand on the one side like a child's toy. So it's in the air. Earth is like a cube. You can take cubes and build stuff with them, pile them up. So it's the foundation, it's the air. Water is like an icosahedron. Because this icosahedron, when you roll it like a dice, it rolls a lot, it flows, like water flows. And finally there was the fifth element that according to Plato or to Kepler is related to the universe, the heavens, the unknown. And this was depicted as a dodecahedron. Now it's interesting if you look at the modern literature, uh, Sir Frank came in 1952 and put forward the hypothesis that actually what happens in supercooled liquids is you are forming icosahedra, local icosahedra, very exactly the same shape that Plato was describing before. And there is actually recent simulations that show that there are some icosahedra clusters that are forming inside the liquid. That's interesting. But why icosahedra? Let's try to understand that. So, if you look at... Uh, so this is about why supercooling works, right? If you look at water, crystalline ice, it forms hexagonal ice. And this is the most common ice form on Earth. The most common crystalline form. So you have the hexagons, and this is just like the beehive. It has these hexagonal patterns, and with these you can build the crystal. It's very nice because they go together nicely, and you can fill the whole space. Also, on the other hand, you have pentagons. Uh, they don't fill up so nicely like the hexagons. If you made the mistake and you order tiles for your bathroom and they are pentagonal, pentagonal, you will have always a problem because there will be a gap there. So you will not be able to cover fully this. And that has to do with the fact that the angle of a, of a, of a pentagon is 108 degrees. So if you say three times 180 is 324 degrees, which is not the 360 that you would need to get the full coverage. Now, the, the point here is that you, what you, can, you, what you, you cannot fill your bathroom with pentagons, but what you can do is you can make 3D structures with them. And this is this example that we spoke about. It has this pentagonal pattern, right? The icosahedron. So, but they are only local. They are not long range. So the argument here goes like this. In physics, very often we call there is this concept of an energy barrier. 
there is a, a state that has a higher energy, a state that has a lower energy, and there is like a, a mountain between them. So in this case, you can imagine this pentagon has a higher energy, and the hexagon has a lower energy. And in order to go from the one to the other, you need to break that and bring another molecule. So there is this energy barrier. And the point is, if the supercooled liquids are forming this kind of icosahedra, they resist the crystallization because you cannot form longer in order with them. And because of this energy barrier, it's possible to supercool. And this has been the, the Frank's hypothesis. There's a lot of the theoretical work done on this. And here is one example from a super simple program that you can just run in one hour in your computer and make figures like this. Uh, this is for a simple liquid where you would have hard spheres bouncing one another. And this is where you get the super cool liquid. So these icosahedra are not, are not something that appears there and stays there. It forms and breaks. They are fluctuating constantly. So you can see they are there they are these kind of local motifs that appear and disappear. And there hasn't been uh, any experiments that can look at this directly. So that's what we are after. We're trying to see whether we can capture this kind of motifs. To do that, we need to use an X-ray laser. Pop quiz number three. What is an X-ray laser? Okay, now I want participation here. So an X-ray laser is a type of laser pointer used for presentations and lectures, like this one here. A kilometer long electron accelerator. A ballistic missile system used for national defense. Or an X-ray instrument you can find in the lab or in the hospital. I'll give you a second to think about it. Okay, so an X-ray laser is who thinks that A is the correct answer? Up with your hands. Nobody? Okay. How about B? A kilometer long electron accelerator. We have a few hands. A lot of hands, that's good. Then, who thinks that C is the correct answer? No? Nobody? Okay. How about D? We have... Quite a few hands as well. Very good. So let me now go through one by one. First of all, if we had an X-ray laser that was like a pointer, it would be quite dangerous because if I point it like this, it might cause some damage. And it, usually, that it wouldn't be you wouldn't be able to see it either because the point of this pointer is to show you where we are looking at, right? So the correct answer is actually B. This is a kilometer-long electron accelerator. Although there was a project in the 80s where they were talking about this, making an extra laser, but it was kind of, from a scientific perspective, not feasible. And uh, finally, there is a lot of ongoing work at the moment of building extra lasers in the lab, as well as at hospitals. At the hospital, they have an extra source that is more like a continuum, but the extra laser is extremely short pulses. It actually looks like this. So you have an uh, extremely long accelerator that generates initially electron pulses and in turn generates X-ray pulses. In real life, it actually looks more like this. And this is taken from Stanford Linear Accelerator Center, which is the world's first hard X-ray laser. And you can see it has the different parts. Uh, this is the injector here. This is the linear accelerator and different other buildings, and finally down here is where the experimental hole is located. Uh, here is another schematic of how it looks like. You have your electron source. It looks like this, the electron source, so you have a visible light that comes and hits a copper anode, and this accelerates electrons. Then you have the electron accelerator that is approximately three kilometers. You want to bring these electrons to go at very high speed because you want to bring them at very high energies. You remember we spoke about the photon energy, and X-rays have very high photon energy, so you need to the electrons to go very high photon energies. Then they go through this, what is called an undulator magnet, which is essentially a, a set of alternating magnets that force the electrons to do this kind of oscillatory motion. 
and they radiate X-rays. And finally, this ends up in the experimental hall. Now, me as a user, I visit these facilities and I spend most of my time here. I don't worry too much about the other part. This is a huge team of people working on this, but my main concern is what is happening in here. So you can see there's a lot of tubes that end up there. This is, uh, by the way, from the European XFEL in Hamburg, which is currently the brightest uh, X-ray source in the world. And uh, you can see there's many stations there. Now, in each of these stations, you have instruments, like the one shown here on the, on the right-hand side, that is part of our work to develop. We develop these kind of instruments. Then we are sitting in the control room with a big team of people and uh, analyzing data, discussing, drinking coffee, thinking about the experiment. And uh, while inside the hatch, we are having the experiment going on. This is what would be the plateau's cave, but instead of having somebody holding our sample, we have a robotic arm that does it for us. So we have the x-rays coming in, and this is a 2D array detector that records all the data that we're getting out. Now, one thing I love about this work is that you work with a big team of people, and uh, it is across uh, borders, across culture, across nationality, uh, you have to basically learn how to handle situations that it's not only about the science, let's say. It, re it requires some kind of social skills as well, and also being able to understand that, okay, maybe it's this person's culture that explains the way this person is acting. So that, that, that's one part that I actually really enjoy about this work. And this is just some pictures from uh, some beam times we had in different countries. All right, let me come, come now to the experiment. So you remember we spoke about the hummingbird, right? We spoke about the contrast. So this is what we're doing here. We are essentially having, uh, instead of a camera, we're having the X-ray laser that has very short pulses. They are so short that you can basically take images of the molecules like standing still, just like the hummingbird. But we do that in reciprocal space, like we explained. Then when you make these pulses longer, you are seeing a blurring happening in real space. And what we are actually rec recording is a blurring happening in reciprocal space. So this is the way we can capture the motion of the molecules. So we record some graphs that look like this. We have contrast here as a function of the pulse duration or the exposure time. And up here is something that has very high contrast. Down here is something that has very low contrast. And when you change the time, this graph goes down. And this is now for a super cool liquid, and this is for a normal. And what we see is that when you go super cool, you are starting to develop this kind of kink here, this kind of behavior. So we think this behavior has to do with the fact that if you look at a water molecule, or let's say if you look at a simple liquid, it would the water molecules would, the molecules would just move around like this. But this kink here has to do with the fact that they are appearing some kind of cages, some kind of uh, confinement by their neighbors. They are trapped there for a second. That has to do with these pictures that I was explaining before. And what is even more interesting is that for water, these already start to appear at room temperature. Even though it's not in the supercooler regime, it becomes much more pronounced, but they are already appearing at room temperature. All right, so, so what? This is the question. Why is this important? Why is this interesting? We believe that this, like I said, these regions, this, this kind of effects are appearing in room temperature, and they are starting to spread in regions. So what you see here is a map, a cartoon, that shows basically some parts in red that are very fast moving, and some parts in blue that are very slow moving. So these kind of regions are developing already at room temperature. They are just starting there. Is this a coincidence, or does it have to do with something special that happens at room temperature? Well, we know that life be happens at room temperature, right? And this is the next step we're investigating now. Is it a coincidence that these domains appear, or do they have a biological significance? And this is now where we are headed with this. And let me tell you now, in my last few slides, towards the future what we are planning to do next. Already next year, we are 
planning an experiment to try to do similar type of measurements using an X-ray laser, but instead of looking at water to make protein movies and figure out what happens when a protein is moving either by itself or with a lot of other proteins together. And how does water influence the motion of these proteins? And that brings me to the last slide. So if you are interested in this stuff, you can read the Physique Axwell, which we wrote an article about this in Swedish. And uh, I would like to thank the members of my group, and especially Rafat here, who helped with the demonstration, and also our volunteer. Sorry? Don't be sorry, you did a great work. <laughs> uh, so then I would like to thank, of course, my collaborators here at Stockholm University and friends. And finally, my collaborators and friends at KTH, DAISY in Germany, and Slack National Accelerator Laboratory. And of course, I would like to thank you for your attention, and I will be happy to have any questions. Thank you. Hi. How, how did you make the super cool water? Yeah, so you basically oh, it's on, okay. So you basically have uh, distillated water, pure water, uh, without any minerals or so. So you cannot use uh, tap water, but if you have uh, pure water, you can do it. And basically, you try to make a sort of a bath, a cool bath, uh, below zero temperature. So yeah, as I, I mean, yeah, you can come down here and see how it looks. It's just ice with, uh, you add some salt just to uh, decrease the uh, melting point. And you put it, you put this distillated water inside just to cool it down without, uh, without any uh, stirring or moving. So you, you, you actually, th this energy barrier you were talking about, uh, you don't change, you don't give it some energy or some push. And then when you try to demonstrate, you, you can shake it or you can pour it on a bit of ice and then this crystallization is starting to happening and forming. So basically just simple water without any other things added. So yeah. Um, you showed this change, it is on. You showed the change in the contrast measurements. Um, are you in increasing the X-ray pulse length or actually the um, averaging time of your experiment? Maybe. Uh, the question is, uh, if let me come back to this slide for a second. <laughs> it's related to the contrast measurements. Uh, we, spo we spoke about here we see the reciprocal space that becomes blurred out. And the question is, is this effect due to the increasing to the pulse length or due to the averaging? Actually, it can happen due to both. If you, if you average the individual speckles, you will get something that looks like this. But we are, what we are doing is we are calculating the contrast for every shot. So in this case, uh, we are varying the pulse duration from a few femtoseconds, and I didn't say too much the details, to a few hundreds of femtoseconds. And uh, what we see is that if you calculate the contrast on a single shot basis, then I you can see this change happening. So, yeah. Any other questions or comments? I, I should say one more thing. Uh, we are currently working with uh, high school students sitting there on the back. You can say hello. And we are investigating the influence of uh, microplastics or the appearance of microplastics in water. And we are very open for projects like this. So if you're interested, just send us an email and we will be happy to organize anything. The, un the, the university is open for you guys. Just come. All right, any final questions or comments? Do you have? Yes, up there. Hey, 
with you. Uh, just uh, I think at the last you just mentioned something that you measured the change of the water shape at room temperature. I'm just curious about what is the effect of the energy of the carried by the X-ray, so it should cause some heat. Very good. This is a uh, now a, a question that I get a lot at conferences actually. The question is basically, what you measure, you shoot x-rays at your water. Does this water do something? Does it warm it up or does it mess up the what you measure, right? But do, what does, what is it just observing or do you influence it? And this is one of the first things we're always testing there. If you put too much actually of too, too hard x-rays, you're starting to do a lot of things. You're starting to increase the temperature, you can ionize it, you can do a lot of nasty stuff. Uh, in this case, it's very important, one of the first things to test is you vary the intensity, how much of the x-rays you put there, by several orders of magnitude, you change that, and you see if there is an effect there. And then you realize, okay, this is too much. You have to go down below this point. So you have to be basically like a probe, just seeing there, not, not disturbing. This has been something that we are apparently working on. And it's going to be a major issue when we're looking at the proteins, for example. Because the water in the hard X-ray regime is not absorbing so much. But if you're looking at the proteins, this, this will be a different story. Any other questions? Yes, there on the back. In one of the last slides you showed <coughs> very complicated molecules and combinations of many different ones. Uh, the scattering pattern would be very, very complicated. How can you sort that out? Thank you. That was a very good question. In the last slide, where I showed this very nice movie, there's a lot of molecules, very complicated ones. How do we figure out what we are measuring, really? This is a challenge, right? We will have to uh, start with something very simple, just a single molecule, and then vary the concentration, for example. That's like the, the current experiment. We have, uh, but to get to this point where we have all these molecules, we will have to, for sure, use combination with computer simulations in order to uh, come back to the real space, you know? Just like we will be looking at scattering patterns, but in order to understand what are the different components we are measuring there, we need to compare with computer simulations. Now, one of the big things about scattering, one of the nice things that I didn't go too much into detail here is that depending on the scattering angle that you are looking at, it's like having a lens can change the zoom. You can either look at longer length scales or look down to the atomic length scale. So that's another way to distinguish what's happening there. And depending also what you have there, it will have different scattering peaks. So you could focus on one species or another species, you know, you could use this as a criteria. But this is ongoing work. Very good question. All right, any final question? comments. That does not seem to be the case. So thank you very much again. Thank you.